The term computer simulation generally refers to something being represented through a computer or computation. In this case, I'm referring to a computer as anything that can run a set of operations, generally mathematical operations, to data in a set order. Simulation is really just another word for copying representation, but in more basic terms, it is just a copy of the universe inside a computer. In this video, we are going to examine how a simulation effectively creates a copy of what it is representing and how a universe can make a copy of itself through a simulation. First, we need to figure out how a simulation can be created within a given universe. A universe at a certain point in time can effectively be represented by a set of numbers. For example, we could assign the value 1 to an electron, 2 to a proton, and 3 to a neutron. In our universe, every particle has momentum, so we can attach the momentum to our particle numbers, making up an array for each particle. So now an electron moving at 3 meters per second in the horizontal direction of 40 degrees and the vertical direction of 60 degrees is displayed as 1, 3, 40, 60, where the first value is the type of particle, the second value is the speed, the third value is the horizontal direction, and the fourth is the vertical direction. Because they also have positions in the universe, we can attach the position of the particle to this array of numbers. In our 3D universe, this could be displayed as three values. Now our single electron is accurately represented using the values 1, 3, 40, 60, 87, 23, 48. If we do this for every single particle in our universe, we have a snapshot of what the universe looks like at that specific moment in time. We can convert this massive set of arrays of numbers into binary, which means the universe is then really made up of what is a single thing, one and not one. This way of thinking was quite popular in the Renaissance and was called monadism, which just means made up of one thing. Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz was a very big advocate for this and was one of the first Western people to actually use binary, which he based off these ancient Chinese characters called hexagrams, which accurately represent binary numbers. In a theoretical universe, there can be many other values that would change how a particle might act. For example, in a spatial four-dimensional universe, there would need to be four values for the position of a particle. Well, our universe's rules are almost solely based on centrality and diffusion of particles, or what might be called push and pull. There's many other digital concepts like transformation and fixicity, rigidity and plasticity, or even more advanced concepts that could alter how quickly or slowly the rules of physics of that universe apply to each particle. This could lead to individual particles having thousands of values attached to them. Now let's take a look at a theoretical two-dimensional universe that will have the following rules applied to each type of particle. One type particles will move towards the closest type 2 particles. One type particles will push away other one type particles. Two type particles will move towards the closest one type particle, and three type particles just won't do anything. The final rule will be particles can't move where another particle is, so they can't stack on top of each other. Type 1 and 2 particles are close to how protons and electrons work in our universe, except in our universe, protons and electrons use a net force instead of just moving towards the closest target particle. I will display how this will work in our very simple simulated universe. On the left is a representation of the universe where each type of particle is a specific color and on the right is all the information of the universe displayed in a numerical format. A universe is just a set of data which has rules applied to it over and over again, which we measure as time in our universe. Time is just the number of times the rules of physics have been applied to the universe. Now we can see exactly how a computer simulates a universe simply by applying some calculations to a data set. If we did this with our universe, it would be indistinguishable for anything inside this simulation because the rules and data set would appear to be exactly the same, which really means it is our universe represented inside a computer through the set of calculations. Now how can a copy of the universe exist inside the universe? The key here is time. Using a simple 2D universe that has a few different rules, Let's try to create a simulation of the universe within the simulation. 
The most important aspect to completing this is that the universe must be able to create a computer that can run all the types of operation seen in the rules of the universe, which could be considered the physics of the universe. With current computing technology, we can't complete all the operations seen in our universe, but we can only recreate extremely small areas of the universe due to currently limited computing power. Because most of the rules are just push and pull rules, which are the four fundamental forces and dark energy, it really just means the rules of our universe are a set of momentum vectors based on the position and velocity of nearby particles. This means our universe can be calculated using addition and subtraction and also some trigonometry. While this sounds simple, the data set of the universe is enormous, meaning there would need to be even more calculations per unit time to accurately simulate the rules of physics in our universe. We're going to make a computer that simply runs the operations of our simple theoretical universe. Or we probably could make this using the given particles of the universe or by adding some new particles, it would be exceedingly complicated. Here are some particle configurations that basically act as transistors, which are the basis for modern computers in our universe. Instead of creating the whole computer, we will just assume this box is a computer built using an assembly language that can run each operation of the universe's physics. We will assume that each calculation will take one unit time and all the calculations are based on mathematics. We will also assume the computer could see all the particles in a given area at one point in time. While this universe will basically see each particle as just the particle, the computer must create the number array for the particle as described before because it runs purely mathematical calculations. Effectively, creating a computer in something like Minecraft follows the same sort of idea because Minecraft follows a different set of rules than our current universe and could really be considered a universe within itself because it is a data set that has a set of rules applied to it over time. Although it does have outside influences like user inputs, which our universe does not appear to have. To make this easier to understand, I will color code the particles on our human view, create how the computer actually sees the universe and the calculations it will run on the data. Now let's take a look at how these things run at once. We can see that the computer is recreating the universe through the calculations it is completing. The computer is creating a simulation through the operations it is running using the particles and physics of the original universe. This is how a universe can copy itself inside itself. While this current speed of computing wouldn't be able to calculate the whole span of the universe because it calculates each unit of time in the simulation slower than the current universe calculates its time, if the computer was faster than the universe, it could effectively look into the future. This is because the rules are consistent and don't have any sort of random elements applied to them. In my previous video, there is an idea called recursive reproductive simulations, which states that if a universe can simulate itself using a computer as just described, if the simulation simulates the computer that is running the simulation, once the computer has simulated up to the current time of the simulation, there is effectively an infinite loop of simulations created because each simulation creates its own simulation of itself and gets stuck in a loop. The main argument of the idea was that if a universe creates two simulations that can do this, it then creates more descendants, creating a scenario that means the most abundant universes are ones that can create as many successful descendants as possible through these internal simulations of the universe. This would create a competition where universes that best succeed in meeting reproductive goals become the most abundant across all universes, which ends up creating the same patterns as life through universes and their simulations of themselves. While our universe is not optimized to immediately create the most descendants, an important point was that complexity and size has various effects on how many living things there would be and how tricky it would be to simulate, which would create a mutation system between universe and simulation. Let's take a look at how this would work from three points of view. The original universe, the simulation of that universe, and the simulation created within the simulation. Firstly, the universe is simply made up of the particles and rules of physics applied to it. The simulation inside that universe is created by the computation 
which match the rules of physics of the universe, but are enabled by the particles and physics of the original universe. The simulation inside the simulation is created using the computations of the computations of the simulation of the original universe, which means computation of the inner simulation is enabled by the computations of the original simulation. This means a minor error in the first simulation is amplified in each generation because the descendant simulations will make the same error but because they are based on the calculations of their direct parent simulations, the errors will be multiplied. I will display how this works. Because in the second generation simulation, the rules of physics are as displayed, when the original universe's physics was actually as displayed, if the same error is made for that simulation's descendant, then we can see the universe quickly mutating into an unrecognizable universe very quickly. This is actually a good representation of how data and information is passed down from parent simulation to child simulation, where the data set and rules of the child simulation is solely based off how accurately the parent simulation has attained the data and calculates the universe. Any errors are passed down to descendants. Well, you might think this is a paradox where a simulation will end up having infinite information. It actually isn't because the only information being used is the one from the current parent simulation. Any grandparent or further ancestor simulations are in no way accessible to the current simulation. In order to access grandchildren or further descendants, you'd have to either simulate them in your current universe, making them just simply child descendants, or enter the child simulation and then enter the grandchild simulation. While things in that simulation would still actually be there, they are based solely off their parent, which means they are really just a representation created within their parent. To break this down, we really just need to think of the universe as a function with the starting data set as a parameter. Well, we could break the laws of physics down into separate functions and have the universe as a function of how many units time it has experienced. In this example, we are just going to combine the universe into a single function and make the starting parameter as the original position of the particles in the universe. Now if a universe can create a copy of itself through a simulation, this ends up being analogous to a universe running a function of itself, again, with the initial data set of the universe. While this is a still a single function, it will repeatedly create the universe because the function is calling itself within itself. If we add a small change to the data set for each simulation, then we end up getting a huge number of different universes created by a single function. While I'm using a simple string, entire universes can be represented using very large sets of numbers where each point in time could be represented using a huge matrix of data for each particle, like shown here. Each snapshot of time could then be stored in an array of snapshots, sort of like a photo book, which would then represent the entire universe in an array of snapshots in time. While a recursive function on your own computer is run on the same computer, in this simulation scenario, the calculation for the function is run inside the simulation, which means in terms of time required to run the inner simulation, it gets smaller and smaller for each descendant, as we can see here. Remember, this information is not accessible from the original simulation, only the direct parent, so it isn't creating infinite information in the current universe. The top simulation is only calculating the particles for that simulation. All of the descendants are representations in their parents. In a way, this creates a new dimension for each descendant simulation, which is sort of an advanced type of time. In summary, a simulation of a universe is just the conversion of that universe into a set of numbers and calculations which are stored and calculated with a computer inside the universe if the rules of physics in that universe allow for computers to be created. Any descendant simulations, which can be called simulations within a simulation, could be created, then the original simulation simulates itself, but any errors or changes from the original universe would be applied to the descendant universe or simulation, making it connected to the parent simulation and not the original universe. This makes the universe a recursive reproductive simulation that can create many varied universes from a single starting function. 
I believe the highest level universes are probably just a set of mathematical functions that had a way to reproduce within themselves, which means the function and its descendant functions that best complete their reproductive goals become the most abundant. So if you were to pick a random universe across all of them, it would be extremely likely that you pick one of those, ones that can copy themselves. While these functions don't directly compete with each other, they do compete indirectly because the most common universes are the ones that are the most successful at creating descendants, but are also successful in terms of reproduction. Thank you for watching.